Friends in Christ, grace and peace to this day from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. How many of you have ever been to a play and left the theater disliking all of the characters that you saw on stage? I know I have before. Or maybe uh, you've been to the movie theater, you've watched a movie, and, and, and you were not impacted by the actors that were on the screen. I mean, you didn't like the hero, you didn't really hate the villain, and you didn't feel particularly sorry for the victim either. Well, the, the result of such an experience is that you probably didn't get the story that was told, and therefore you, you probably didn't enjoy the performance. Well, you know, the parable that Jesus tells in today's gospel lesson is just like that. I mean, look at all the characters that we meet in this gospel text. First, there's the rich man, right? The landowner, probably an absent landlord who charges his tenants enormous rent to grow crops on his land. And when he hears that his manager, his, his caretaker, might be skimming the profits, he fires him, right? No investigation, no discussion, no time for explanation. He fires him on the spot because of rumors that he's been hearing. Well then, consider the manager, right? The caretaker. When faced with the prospect of unemployment, he decides that he can't get a real job, and he's too proud, it says in Scripture, to beg. So what does he do? He helps the renters, the debtors, forge payment receipts on their bills, thinking that the renters will be so appreciative that they'll be kind to him in a month or so when he's out of a job. Well, the truth of the matter is that he blackmailed them, right? Blackmailed them into taking care of him. And what about these people who owe the landlord money, the debtors? Aren't they every bit as guilty as the caretaker, the manager himself? I mean, did they lie? Did they cheat? and steal from the landowner by forging their bill? Yeah, they did. Well, returning to that rich man, the landowner, it says in Scripture that he is actually impressed by the brilliant scheme that the caretaker employs. <coughs> I wish I would have thought of that, is his response. This should tell you what kind of unethical character the landowner has been all along. And so that's the story that Jesus tells us in this parable today. And so let me ask you, who do you like in this story? <laughs> Which characters do you cheer for? Which victims do you feel sorry for? Which villain do you love to hate? I mean, looking at this gospel text, they're all rascals, aren't they? And none of them seem to have a redeeming quality or a hint of integrity inside of them. <coughs> Here's the hard part. Jesus seems to say that we should emulate the shrewd, though dishonest manager for the way that he fleeced his former boss. I mean, right there in verse 9, it says, Make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into eternal homes. <laughs> what in the world are you trying to tell us, Jesus? It's a stumper, isn't it? Well, friends, you need to know that this parable has baffled Bible scholars, uh, Bible scholars for generation upon generation. And many have called it the most puzzling story that Jesus ever told. And here, I get to preach on my very first Sunday, here at our Savior's, this parable that Jesus tells. Wow. <laughs> Welcome to our Savior's, Pastor Tim. <laughs> Well, interpretations of this passage from Luke's Gospel have ranged from, well, maybe what it's trying to say is that people of the world are wiser than people of God. Or, or maybe it's trying to say, use money in any way that will have long-term effects. I mean, one theologian even suggests that money may be the hero of this story. That money can be a god, or money can be a servant, and because the caretaker, the manager, used money as a means, a means to the end, to an end, so should we. Well, because there's no right or wrong interpretation of this odd story that Jesus tells us, it seems to me that the preacher has a blank canvas, a blank page to write his sermon, which I did. 
you know, maybe he could preach something about corruption, because there's certainly corruption in this gospel story, this parable. And he could maybe preach something about materialism, or something about money, but I'm not going to preach money on my very first Sunday, right? Now today, I want to use this difficult parable in order to say something about uncertainty. Uncertainty. I mean, the time is right for a sermon about uncertainty, right? And why? Because we are in an uncertain world. Think about it. The upcoming presidential election. Racism. Racial tension in our world. Terrorism. ISIS. Tension between Russia and the United States. China. North Korea. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uncertainty is a word that best describes our circumstances these days. And uncertainty is what we have in common with the manager in the story that Jesus told. I mean, his story, his, his story was he wasn't rocked by a terrorist attack or he wasn't shaken by some economic slowdown. In fact, his circumstances could very well have been a result of his own doing. But friends, he too was filled with fear because of a future that was unknown. And so the caretaker considers his three alternatives. I mean, Scripture tells us that he's too weak to dig. He rules that out as a possibility. Maybe, maybe he's an older person and his working days are long in the past. Or, or perhaps he has a medical condition that he will not let him work. Or maybe digging is just beneath him. He's too proud to get his hands dirty. Well, in any event, he decides that being a common laborer, it's not possible. Secondly, we see in Scripture that he's not willing to beg, because that would be too humiliating. He's a proud man, and proud men don't ask for help. You know, I recall a few years ago when the Asian economy weekend, maybe you remember this as well, there were businessmen <coughs> in Japan who could not bring themselves to tell their families that they had lost their jobs. And so each day... They continue to dress in their three-piece fine suits, pack up their briefcases, and head downtown Tokyo just to sit on a bench for 10 hours. They were unemployed. They were too proud to ask for help. And so, too, was it with our manager and our, our parable for today. What he failed to understand, and so sometimes do we, is that people want to help people who are in need. I see that here at, your, at our Savior's Lutheran Church. Just on Friday, I got a chance to come down and greet the volunteers who serve the, uh, the midtime uh, the new meal to those who are in need. We have such organizations like Red Cross and Salvation Army. We have entertainers who oftentimes join together to raise millions of dollars to help recovery efforts after a natural disaster. I mean, our natural instinct, right, is to help people who are in need. Too bad the manager in our, our parable didn't know that. And so what does he resort to? He resorts to theft, blackmail. He draws countless farmers and their wives and their children into a scheme that corrupts them all. And notice the language that's key here that the manager uses. Right there in verse 6, he says, sit down quickly. Do this quickly. Don't consider your other options. Don't consider the consequences. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. Who's to say, just sign right here? Let's do it quickly. You know, friends, when I look back on my own life, the poorest decisions that I have made, I've made quickly. You know, in times of uncertainty, in times of fear or embarrassment, I have made decisions that later have come back to haunt me, have caused me further embarrassment. You know, sitting down quickly and making knee-jerk decisions almost always, almost always have negative consequences. We don't know what happened to the manager and his farmer friends. I mean, the parable ends and we don't know what happened to them in the future. Jesus doesn't reveal that to us. But you have to wonder, right? Whatever happened to that corrupt, that shrewd manager? I mean, he had taken more time. Just think, what if he would have taken more time? Could he have come up with a better solution? Which leads me to the fourth alternative, which the manager did, did not consider. Notice in this gospel text that there's no mention of God anywhere. Perhaps the manager was not a religious man, and so it would have been out of his character for him to kneel down, kneel down and pray for about, about his future. 
Think about him. He must have felt alone. He must have felt that he was the only one who could have solved the dilemma that he was in. Think about it. He could have told God that he had made a mess of his life and that he was sorry, asked for forgiveness. Or he could have told God that he had been falsely accused. He, have, he could have prayed for discernment, asking God for guidance and peace. The scripture said he sat down quickly and expected others to do the same. You know, friends, I know that many in this congregation have concerns about the future. I do too. Some of you have maybe jobs that are in jeopardy. Others maybe have no jobs at this time. Some of you, aside from the obvious worries that all of us seem to share, are concerned about your health and uncertain future. Others of you maybe are, are part of a fractured relationship, a fractured marriage right now, and that's bringing emotional pain to you. Others of you may be concerned about your children. I just dropped one off at college last week for the first time. Oh, my wife and I, Chandra, we are worried about her. She's got to make her own decisions now. Or, or maybe you're worried about your own parents and aging their health. Whatever it is, I want you to know, friends, today, that you're not alone. You're not alone. See, there's a God who promises to stand beside you in any storm. And secondly, your circumstances, nothing, is, is not something that you have to resolve by yourself. I don't know where we got this in our world, that we have to resolve all of our own issues. We have to deal with them by ourselves. No, we have a God who is anxiously waiting to hear your voice, to calm your fear. I know for some that this is very hard. You've been distant from God for a long time. You've maybe forgotten how to pray. Please know that God longs especially to hear your voice. You are a child of God. And finally, friends, this is the time to be the church. This is time to be our Savior's Lutheran church. Even as we celebrate and even as we grieve the leaving of Pastor Jennifer and Pastor Eric, we know that we're in the midst of change, don't we? Change is hard. But remember that we are in this together. We're in this together. You know, I'm reminded of the story of the weathered old sea captain who was once asked if he knew the meaning of the word fellowship. Fellowship, he said. Well, that's when all the fellows are in the same ship. <laughs> and so are we. We are in the same ship. We are cruising now through uncharted waters. But we're not alone. For our God, our marvelous God, our gracious God, our loving God, goes way, way before us. That's good news. Praise be to you, O God.